I want every American to know that I'm taking inflation uh, very seriously, and it's my top domestic priority. And I'm here today to talk about solutions. President Joe Biden laying out steps designed to bring down inflation, running at a four-decade high. And he contrasts his approach with what he's calling ultra-MAGA Republicans, referring to for President Donald Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again. Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. President's speech coming as the national average for a price of gasoline hits a new record, according to AAA, $4.37 a gallon. We'll talk with energy reporter at the Washington Post, Evan Halper. U.S. Senate one day away from a test vote on an abortion rights bill. That vote is the Democrats' response to the leaked draft Supreme Court opinion that would reverse the court's Roe v. Wade decision that made abortion legal everywhere. Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell asked today about his recent comments that if Republicans regain a Senate majority, they could bring up a bill to make abortion illegal nationwide. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen telling a Senate committee that limiting access to abortion will have damaging economic effects. On Russia's war in Ukraine, U.S. House and Senate moving quickly to approve a new aid package for Ukraine, nearly $40 billion. Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines testifying to another Senate committee that Russian President Vladimir Putin is planning for a long war in Ukraine. And in Great Britain, Prince Charles filling in for the first time for his ailing mother, Queen Elizabeth II, at the state opening of Parliament. This from CNN.com. President Joe Biden on Tuesday blamed the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's war in Ukraine for troubling economic news as he and his administration went on the defensive over mounting inflation and rising gas prices. The president's speech at the White House was advertised by his advisors as being focused on his plan to fight inflation. While Biden did speak about inflation, he spent a significant amount of time attacking Republicans for a plan put out by the Senate GOP campaign arm that from CNN. Here's President Biden. Americans have two potential to pass forward. The first is my plan, the Democratic plan. plan put forward by congressional Republicans is a second alternative. Here's how each of us would take, tackle inflation. My plan is to lower employer, lower everyday costs for everyday costs for hardworking Americans, and lower the deficit by asking large corporations and the wealthiest Americans to not engage in price gouging and to pay their fair share in taxes. The Republican plan is to increase taxes on the middle class families, let billionaires and large companies off the hook as they raise profit, raise prices and reap profits at record number, record amounts. And it's really that simple. But let me explain why this choice is so important. Let me start. Let me start with the Putin price hike, high gas prices and energy prices. My plan is already in motion. I led the world and other countries to join with us to coordinate the largest release of oil from our stockpiles of all the countries in history, 240 million barrels to boost global supply. Here at home, U.S. oil and gas production is approaching record levels. In fact, we produced more oil domestically in my first year in office than my predecessor did in his first year. To further drive down prices, my administration is allowing the the sale of gasoline using homegrown biofuels, biofuels this summer, which wasn't allowed before. And to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and reckless autocrats like Putin, I'm working with Congress to pass landmark investments to help build a clean energy future as well. From tax credits for businesses to produce renewable energy, to tax credits for families to make their homes more energy efficient. I met with nearly a dozen CEOs of America's largest utility companies. And they, to a person, told me that, and that including Southern Company, American Electric Power, and 10 others, they confirmed that if we pass the investments I'm talking about, we'll immediately lower families' utility bills by as much as $500 a year, according to their one estimate. That's by the way, they're going to make their homes more secure in terms of heat not getting out and air conditioning not escaping because they have, they have good insulation. Now, what's the congressional Republican plan with respect to energy? First of all, their plan is to give oil companies a free pass. For example, right now, oil companies are sitting on 9,000 unused leases, oil leases, 
which are the property of the federal government, on the property of the federal government. Under my plan, they would have to pay taxes, and if they don't use those leases to produce more oil, they just can't sit on it. Unlike under the Republican plan, they'd be allowed to continue to sit on this land without producing while shipping record profits back to their investors. The fact is, the average cost of a barrel of oil has been steady for weeks. So, uh, so why do gas prices keep going up so high? Republicans have offered plenty of blame, but not a single solution to actually bring down the energy prices. President Biden in the Eisenhower Executive Office building, part of the White House complex. He went on to discuss ways to unclog supply chains, reduce high prescription drug costs, and talked about tax policy, again, contrasting what he's proposing to the Republicans. And he ended by referring in general to the Republican policies, calling them extreme. I know you got to be frustrated. I know. I can taste it. Frustrated by high prices, by gridlock in Congress, by the time it takes to get anything done. Believe me, I understand the frustration. But the fact is, congressional Republicans, not all of them, but the mega Republicans are counting on you to be as frustrated by the pace of progress, which they have everything, they've done everything they can to slow down that you're going to will hand power over to them and enact so they can enact their extreme agenda. Look at their agenda. We'll put up on a web page somewhere, I think I can do this, the Scott plan. It's in writing. We need a government focused on what families actually need. So I urge all Americans to think about the path I've laid forward. We're going to have to do more beyond what I laid forward. But then think about the Republicans in Congress are actually proposing. Which path is right for you and for your family and, quite frankly, for America? President Biden mentioning the Scott plan that Senator Rick Scott, Republican from Florida, chair of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, which raises money for Senate Republican candidates, Senator Scott, ahead of the president's remarks, putting out a written statement calling the president unwell and incoherent and calling on the president to resign. The president today asked about it. You called out Rick Scott Scott a little while ago in your remarks. Earlier today, anticipating your remarks, he said, and I'm just quoting here, that uh, the best thing, most effective thing Joe Biden can do to solve the inflation crisis he created is resign. He's the problem. The senator, added later, the senator added later, Joe Biden is unwell, he's unfit for office, he's incoherent, incapacitated, and confused. These are his words. Offering you a chance to respond. I think the man has a problem. Can I ask you about President, President, Biden? Biden. President Biden taking reporters' questions after that speech on ways to combat inflation. The senator Rick Scott himself speaking to reporters on Capitol Hill today about inflation and his criticism of the president's fitness for office. In Joe Biden's economy, we have 8.5 percent inflation, which is a 40-year high. We've got the highest gas prices in the history of the country. We've got a labor participation rate that's low. We've got inflation that's going way faster than wage growth. We've got a GDP that's declining. Now we've got mortgage rates that are significantly up just just this year. Joe Biden gave a talk this morning, blamed everybody else on inflation. He took no responsibility and has no plan. I think what all Floridians know is this president has no ability to deal with inflation. In the private sector, when you have a CEO that doesn't have the ability to deal with something, they resign. They go on and do something else. Joe Biden ought to do the exact same thing, and that's the only way we're ever going to get inflation under control in this country. More now on inflation with Washington Post business reporter Evan Halper. He joins us by phone. Thank you for being with us. You write that gasoline prices surged to a new high despite White House efforts to stabilize them. What has President Biden attempted and why hasn't it worked? Well, there's only so much authority that the president has to uh, to mitigate the, you know, the increases in in gas prices. And and a couple of things he's tried to do is obviously um, release a whole bunch of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, and thing that he did was make um, higher blends of ethanol available or ethanol and gasoline available year-round. 
Um, you know, but these are these are modest moves. Uh, you know, when facing the kind of market forces that he is, and so they they haven't been able to stop prices from continuing to go up. The president has set up a, a contrast with the Republicans. They have their own ideas, but it's I guess not what the president feels he can do. In terms of gas prices, yeah, I mean Republicans are saying there should be more drilling. You should ease environmental laws. Uh, you know, they they talk about a lot of things that. Um, maybe could be done to to give more of a boost to you know fossil fuel companies, but uh, you know the reality is that no matter who is president, you know at this very moment, uh, the possibility of being able to to put more oil into the you know nation's um, fuel supply is is limited. You know this, a lot of this has to do with uh, investing in infrastructure, and you know those investments take take years. And, you know, some of this is related to the fact that in, early on in the pandemic, oil was trading, you may remember this, at $0 a barrel. Um, and a lot of, uh, you know, the big oil and gas companies pulled back on, on investing because it, it wasn't looking like a good bet. And, um, you know, some of that retrenchment is now, uh, you know, we're now seeing it in sort of the, the shortage of supply today. You note in your article at WashingtonPost.com that we're going to get new numbers out Wednesday from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What are we expecting? Um, you know, the news has consistently not been good, and there are very few indications that inflation is easing. So, you know, part of the speech was Biden getting ahead of those numbers coming out tomorrow. Um, you know, the, the, what, what we're going to see in that data is how much inflation went up in April, um, and I don't think anyone's really expecting the news to be encouraging. We're talking with Evan Halper from The Washington Post. You, you mentioned that President Biden giving the speech get out ahead of it. He also said point blank to American people, inflation is a priority to me. I get it. What's the uh, approach here by the White House? You know, I think the approach is to show that they're paying full attention to this. Um, you know, obviously part of this is anxiety with the midterms coming up, you know, that, that this is not a good political position to be in. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot here for the Republicans to attack Biden on. You know, the the, the Democrats control the the House, they control the Senate, you know, and they control the White House. Um, you know, and it's it's easy for Republicans to say, look, they're in charge. Um, you know, they 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 hold all the keys, and look look at what's happening. You know, to you and your family, and and, and you know, inflation being out of control, and so Biden's trying to flip that narrative and, and say, look, we're doing everything we can. Um, these are some measures we can take. This is what Republicans want to do. You know, and he pointed out, um, you know, Senator Scott's plan, which he characterized as raising taxes on lowest income Americans while, um, you know, giving corporations and, and billionaires um, a pass. As you're looking at the, the economy, what are the main drivers of inflation now? Sure. I mean, energy is is a major one, right? And so, uh, a lot of this. I mean, you know, the reason we saw gas prices go, um, you know, go up to, to new heights today was because the EU is talking about, uh, you know, a, a full on embargo of Russian oil and having that in place by the end of the year. Um, you know, Russia is one of the biggest um, oil and gas producers, obviously, in the world, and pulling that, you know, out of the market just. It, it means a big hit. It's you know, it's it's the kind of it's a hit of the 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 proportion you know that when when you think about like the you know Arab oil embargo of the of the seventies, so that's that's a big a big part of what's what's happening here. And of course, I'm an energy reporter, so um, you know, when I'm looking at inflation and what's driving it, I'm thinking about energy, and, and that's what I'm thinking about. Evan Halper writes for the Washington Post. Find his stories at WashingtonPost.com and on Twitter at Evan Halper. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Wall Street today, the Dow down 84, NASDAQ up 114, S&P up 9. At WashingtonPost.com, Senator Robert Casey, Democrat from Pennsylvania, said Tuesday he would support legislation that would codify Roe v. Wade into law, a dramatic shift for one of the few remaining Democrats in Congress with relatively conservative views on abortion rights. Casey said in a statement, in light of the leaked Supreme Court decision draft overturning Roe v. Wade and the subsequent reports that Republicans in the U.S. House and Senate 
will introduce legislation to enact a nationwide six-week ban. The real question of the moment is, do you support a categorical ban on abortion? During my time in public office, I have never voted, nor do I support such a ban. That statement from Senator Casey, some reporting from the Washington Post. Well, the Senate plans a procedural vote on an abortion rights bill on Wednesday, one brought up by the Democrats. It's not expected to pass because it won't get the 60 votes needed to advance in the legislative process. Well, Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell is speaking to reporters today about that bill and asked about his recent interview during which he said it was possible Republicans might bring up a abortion ban bill should they get the majority after the next election. We've heard a lot of your suggestions here about what your interpretation is of the Democrats' bill on abortion here and what you think it would be. But what we have not heard and what has not been clear is what the Republicans intend to do on abortion. Do you intend to have a bill to ban abortion nationwide if this uh, leak is in fact accurate? What, what is exactly what Republicans want on abortion? Uh, First, let me make it perfectly clear, in spite of suggestions to the contrary, there are no issues which Senate Republicans believe should be exempt from the 60-vote threshold. In other words, there's zero sentiment in the Republican conference in the Senate uh, to get rid of the filibuster. Some of you know I have many flaws, but being inconsistent is not one of them. I said repeatedly no to President Trump when he was there and wanted to to get rid of that. Historically, there have been abortion votes on the floor of the Senate. None of them have achieved 60 votes. This particular measure the Democrats have today is particularly radical, and I'll call on um, others to comment on the radical nature of it. But I think it's safe to say there aren't 60 votes there at the federal level, no matter who happens to be in the majority, no matter who happens to be in the White House. So I think the widespread sentiment of my conference is that this issue will be dealt with at the state level. Um, The Supreme Court, if this becomes the decision, has obviously said this is ripe for discussion in democratic bodies. We happen to be a democratic body. Schumer is proving that by having us vote on it uh, tomorrow. But I think I'm pretty safe in saying most of my members believe this will be dealt with at the state level. Can you rule out, will you rule out, holding a vote if you're the majority leader on a bill to ban abortions nationwide? We're going to, let me try it one more time. I, I think the sentiment in my conference is for this issue to be dealt with at the state level if we are in fact confronted with a final Supreme Court decision that throws this issue back into democratic processes. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, with reporters on Capitol Hill, news conference with other Senate Republican leaders. The Senate Democratic leadership holding their own separate news conference and Senator Patty Murray from Washington State, previewing Wednesday's procedural vote on an abortion rights bill. What this bill does is simple. It follows the Constitution and nearly half a century of precedent and gives patients the right to get an abortion no matter where in America that patient or doctor lives. When we vote on this bill, every single senator is going to have to go on the record as to whether they want to take their constituents' rights away. Republicans are going to have to go on record as to whether they want this to be the first generation of American women with less freedom than their mothers. They can try all they want to distract from what's really at stake here, but the bottom line is tomorrow they're going to have to vote. And when they do, women across the country whose rights are at stake, whose lives are at stake even, will be watching closely. And I'll be watching closely too. And I can personally guarantee you, we are going to remember everyone who votes against the right to an abortion. And this November, we'll use our voices and our votes. We're not going to let anyone forget. Senator Patty Murray, Democrat, Washington State, the assistant majority leader at a news conference on Capitol Hill. You can follow the Senate proceedings on Wednesday as they can move towards that procedural vote on C-SPAN 2 television or Listen and watch anywhere on this free C-SPAN Now 
mobile video app, and it's streamed at cspan.org. The Senate Monday night passed by voice vote a bipartisan bill to increase security for Supreme Court justices and their families. Abortion rights activists protesting Monday night outside the Virginia home of Justice Samuel Alito, author of that leaked draft opinion that would overturn the Roe v. Wade decision. This is also following weekend protests outside the Maryland homes of two other conservative justices. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying today that he is okay with protests outside of justices' homes as long as those protests are peaceful. Schumer saying that he sees protests outside his own home several days a week. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen telling the Senate Banking Committee today that denying access to legal abortion or restricting the access would damage the U.S. economy and hurt the finances of women. After Yellen said that to Senator Robert Menendez, Democrat from New Jersey, there was this follow-up exchange with Senator Tim Scott, Republican from South Carolina. Some of your comments in response to Bob's question I found troubling. And just from a clarity's perspective, say, did you say that ending the life of a child is good for the labor force participation rate? Giving someone the access, let me just quote what you said, that ultimately increasing access to abortion uh, and reproductive health care allows for our labor force participation rate to continue to increase, that denying women access to abortion increases their odds of living in poverty or need for public assistance as a guy who was raised by a single mom who worked long hours to keep us out of poverty. I think people can disagree on the issue of being pro-life or, or, or pro-abortion, but in the end, I think framing it in the context of labor force participation is, it just feels calloused to me. I, I think uh, finding a way to have a debate around abortion in a, a, a meeting for the economic stability of our country is harsh. Uh, and I'm just surprised that we find ways to weave into every facet of our lives, such, such an important and painful reality for so many people to make it sound like it's just a, another 0.4% added to our labor force participation as a result of the issue of abortion just, to me, seems harsh. And well, I, I certainly don't mean to... Um say what I think the effects are in a manner that's harsh. What we're talking about is um, whether or not women will have the ability um, to regulate their reproductive um, situation in ways that will enable them to plan lives that are fulfilling and satisfying for them. And one aspect of a satisfying life is being able to feel that you have the financial resources to raise a child, that the children you bring into the world are wanted, and that you have the ability to take care of them. In many cases, um, abortions are of teenage women, um, particularly low income and often black, who um, aren't in a position to be able to care for children, have um, unexpected pregnancies, and it deprives them of the ability often to continue their education, to later participate in the workforce. So there there is a spillover into labor force participation, but, and uh, it means that children will grow up in poverty and do do worse themselves. Thank you. Let me me just claim my time on the topic. This is the truth. I'll just simply say that as a guy raised by a black woman in abject poverty, I'm thankful to be here as United States Senator first. Second thing I'd say is that we we can at the same time have a real conversation about increasing child tax credits that are refundable. We can at the same time have a conversation about uh, the opportunity to have a, a, a more, more robust system around the issue of child care, of early childhood education. We could have a conversation about financial literacy. There's a lot of ways for us to address the issue about the child that's here. So th- that just to me was, was, was a, 
uh, unusually piercing comments that you, that you made. Senator Tim Scott, Republican from South Carolina, questioning the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen at today's Senate Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee hearing. Secretary Yellen was before the committee primarily discussing the annual report of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. She says the U.S. financial system is working well, but Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's COVID-19 lockdowns are making some things more expensive. We covered the hearing. You can find it in its entirety at our video library at cspan.org. This from USA Today. Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk said that if his deal to acquire Twitter goes through, he would let former President Donald Trump return to the platform. During an interview with the Financial Times, Musk said Tuesday he had talked with Twitter co-founder and former CEO Jack Dorsey, and they agree Twitter should not support permanent bans on accounts unless it involves bots or spam or scams. It was not correct to ban Donald Trump. I think that was, that was a mistake um, because it, uh, it alienated a large part of the country and did not ultimately result in Donald Trump not having a voice. He is now going to be on Truth Social, um, as will uh, a large part of the sort of the, the right in the, in the United States. Um, and so I think this could end up being, frankly, worse than having a, sing, you know, a single forum where everyone can debate. Um, so um, I, I guess the answer is that I, 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 I would reverse the perma ban. I'll say I'm not, I don't own Twitter yet, so this is not like a thing that will definitely happen, because what if I don't own Twitter? Um, but my opinion, and Jack Dorsey, I want to be clear, shares this opinion, uh, is that we should not have perma, perma bans. Um, now, now I, that doesn't mean that somebody gets to say whatever they want to say. If they say something that is um, illegal or um, otherwise, you know, uh, just you know, just destructive to the world, then then that there should be perhaps a timeout, uh, a, a temporary suspension, or, or that particular tweet uh, should be uh, uh, made invisible or or have very limited uh, traction. Um, but I think perma bans just fundamentally undermine trust in Twitter as a, a, a town square uh, where um, everyone can uh, voice their opinion. Elon Musk, part of an interview at a Financial Times forum today. More on the from the USA Today article. Former President Donald Trump was permanently banned from Twitter after the January 6, 2021 U.S. Capitol riot. Twitter cited the risk of further incitement of violence. Washington Today continues in a moment. The weekly podcast is a unique offering from C-SPAN. We tape it right here in the C-SPAN studios in beautiful downtown Capitol Hill. In the town where extremes get all the attention... This isn't more extreme opinion, it's extreme history. From what's new and happening right now, relive the history you know. So listen, follow, and enjoy the C-SPAN podcast, The Weekly. Find it wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. A few more headlines. Congressman Tom Reed, Republican from New York, announcing he is resigning from Congress. This is just over a year after a former lobbyist accused him of sexual misconduct. And as the Pulitzer Prizes handed out this week, Ukrainian journalists awarded a special citation. The Pulitzer Board says it's for their courage, endurance, and commitment to truthful reporting during Vladimir Putin's ruthless invasion of their country and his propaganda war in Russia. Well, on the war in Ukraine, this from Associated Press, Russia pummeled the vital port of Odessa, Ukrainian officials said Tuesday, in an apparent effort to disrupt supply lines and Western weapons shipments critical to Kyiv's defenses. Ukraine's ability to stymie a larger, better-armed Russian military has surprised many who had anticipated a much quicker end to the conflict. The U.S. Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, testifying today before the Senate Armed Services Committee and saying that it's the intelligence community's assessment that this war will not end soon. 
the next month or two of fighting will be significant as the Russians attempt to reinvigorate their efforts, but even if they are successful, we are not confident that the fight in the Donbas will effectively end the war. We assess President Putin is preparing for a prolonged conflict in Ukraine during which he still intends to achieve goals beyond the Donbas. We assess that Putin's strategic goals have probably not changed, suggesting he regards the decision in late March to refocus Russian forces on the Donbass as only a temporary shift to regain the initiative after the Russian military's failure to capture Kyiv. And his current near-term military objectives are to capture the two oblasts in Donetsk and Luhansk with a buffer zone, encircle Ukrainian forces from the north and the south to the west of the Donbass, in order to crush the most capable and well-equipped Ukrainian forces who are fighting to hold the line in the east, consolidate control of the land bridge Russia has established from Crimea to the Donbas, occupy Kherson, and control the water source for Crimea, that is to the north. And we also see indications that the Russian military wants to extend the land bridge to Transnistria. And while the Russian forces may be capable of achieving most of these near-term goals in the coming months, we believe that they will not be able to extend control over a land bridge that stretches to Transnistria and includes Odessa without launching some form of mobilization. And it is increasingly unlikely that they will be able to establish control over both oblasts and the buffer zone they desire in the coming weeks. But Putin most likely also judges that Russia has a greater ability and willingness to endure challenges than his adversaries, and he is probably counting on US and EU resolve to weaken as food shortages, inflation, energy prices get worse. Moreover, as both Russia and Ukraine believe they can continue to make progress militarily, we do not see a viable negotiating path forward, at least in the short term. Avril Haines is the Director of National Intelligence today on Capitol Hill before the Senate Armed Services Committee. United Nations General Assembly voting overwhelmingly today to let the Czech Republic replace Russia on the United Nations Human Rights Council. The UN previously voted to suspend Russia's participation in the council over allegations of human rights violations by Russian soldiers in Ukraine. U.S. House and Senate moving to approve a new aid package for Ukraine. It encompasses military, economic, and humanitarian aid after Republicans insisted and President Biden agreed to decouple that Ukrainian aid from a separate emergency request for COVID-19 related program funding. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor today. Later today, the House is set to vote on a, on nearly $40 billion in emergency aid to help Ukraine as the Ukrainians continue to fight back quite successfully against Russian aggression. This is a large package But the need is great, and time is of the essence. After the House passes the legislation, it is my intention for the Senate to act on it as soon as we can. The President has called on both chambers of Congress to act quickly on the Ukrainian aid package, so act quickly we must. The Ukrainian ambassador will be visiting us at our caucus lunch this afternoon to discuss the upcoming package and she will let us know how important it is to quickly approve it. Quickly approving this emergency funding is essential to helping the people of Ukraine in their fight against the vicious Putin. It will mean more funding to provide javelins, stingers, howitzers, switchblade unmanned aerial munitions, and other critical equipment. And it will mean more food, supplies, and shelter for the millions of Ukrainian refugees who are in the midst of the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War. We have a moral obligation to stand with our friends in Ukraine. The fight they are in is a struggle between democracy and authoritarianism itself, and we dare not relent or delay swift action to help our friends in need. And make no mistake, the Senate will move swiftly to get an emergency funding package passed and sent to the President's desk. Senator Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, Democrat from New York, on the Senate floor today. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development predicting that Russia's economy, hit by international sanctions during the war, expected to contract by 10% in 2022, and Ukraine's economy to shrink this year by 30%. 
From CBS News, Dateline Manila, Philippines, the Marcos family, famously driven from power and out of the country in 1986 by Filipinos fed up with 21 years of Ferdinand Marcos's authoritarian rule, inched ever closer to a remarkable return to power on Tuesday. An unofficial tally showed the son and namesake of the late dictator, who goes by his boyhood nickname Bong Bong, had garnered a record number of votes in Monday's presidential election. What might this mean for U.S. relations with the Philippines? Questions today to the State Department spokesman, Ned Price. How do you expect Marcos's presidency will have an impact on relations with the U.S. and American efforts to curb Chinese influence in the region? And then I have a question on Sudan as well, if that's okay. Uh, well, your question jumps ahead uh, just a little bit. Uh, we're, we're not not quite there. We're monitoring the election results, uh, and we look forward to renewing our special partnership uh, and to working with the next administration on key human rights and regional priorities. Uh, as I said, we look forward to working with uh, the president's elect once that person is officially named uh, to strengthen the enduring alliance between uh, the United States and the Philippines. Uh, it's an enduring alliance that is rooted in a long and deeply interwoven history, uh, shared democratic values and interests, and strong uh, people-to-people ties between our countries. As friends, as partners, as allies, uh, we'll continue to collaborate closely to advance a free and open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient uh, Indo-Pacific region. We'll also continue, as I said before, to promote respect for human rights and the rule of law, uh, which is fundamental to U.S. relations uh, with the Philippines and in other bilateral contexts as well. Uh, and we're very pleased to welcome uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs locks into Washington this week uh, for the U.S. ASEAN Summit. Okay, and then... Well, maybe, before I go to Sudan, you know, all signs point to the, the, uh, the, the conclusion that, uh, that Marcos has won. So do you have any concerns about Bong Bong Marcos being the... Uh, the new president of the Philippines? What I can say from a technical standpoint is that we understand the casting and counting of votes to have been conducted in line with international standards and without significant uh, incident. Uh, Again, the counting is still underway. It is not for us uh, to declare a winner. We'll wait for the Philippines election authorities to do that. I'm just asking you if you have any particular concerns about uh, Marcos's son uh, becoming the next president. We, we you certainly had concerns about Duterte. We look forward to working with the president-elect on the shared values and the shared interests uh, that have united our countries across generations. State Department spokesman Ned Price with reporters in the State Department briefing room. If the results in the Philippines election stand, Bong Bong Marcos will take office next month to start a six-year term as president with Sarah Duterte as his vice president. She's the daughter of the outgoing president, Rodrigo Duterte. In London, reporting from Reuters, Britain's heir to the throne, Prince Charles and Prince William took center stage amid the pomp and pageantry of the opening of Parliament on Tuesday, replacing the 96-year-old Queen Elizabeth who missed the grand set-piece event with health issues. With the Queen forced to withdraw for the first time in almost 60 years, Charles stepped in to read out the government's legislative agenda at the Palace of Westminster, first time he has taken on such a major constitutional duty. My lords and members of the House of Commons, Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy and help ease the cost of living for families. Her Majesty's Government will level up opportunity in all parts of the country and support more people into work. Her Majesty's Ministers will continue to support the police to make the streets safer and fund the National Health Service to reduce the COVID backlogs. In these challenging times, Her Majesty's Government will play a leading role in defending democracy and freedom across the world, including continuing to support the people of Ukraine. Her Majesty's Government will drive economic growth to improve living standards and fund sustainable investment in public services. This will be underpinned by a responsible approach to the public finances reducing debt while reforming and cutting taxes. Prince Charles at the state opening of British Parliament, reading a speech written by the elected government, currently led by Prime Minister Boris Johnson. 
Associated Press adding this, the monarch traditionally arrives in a horse-drawn carriage, sits on the sovereign's throne in the House of Lords, and wears the imperial state crown. But Charles sat not on the sovereign's throne, which had been removed, but on the consort's throne, which had been used by his father, Prince Philip. In the place of where the queen's throne normally is placed, the imperial state crown was placed on a velvet cushion. And you heard Charles delivered the speech in the third person, using Her Majesty's government instead of my government. Also this from AP, the Queen formally asked Prince Charles to deliver the speech under rules that allow her to delegate some of her duties to senior members of the royal family who are considered councillors of state. Councillors of state are required to act in pairs, so Charles was accompanied by his eldest son, Prince William. Queen Elizabeth has missed only two other state openings of Parliament, 1959 and 63, during pregnancies. And during those times, Parliament was opened by a royal commission. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. You can get more top Washington stories sent to you every day by subscribing to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. Sign up at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night.